While Spider-Man the Animated Series ended its five season run, Marvel still wanted a Spider-Man show to air on Fox Kids. And instead of extending the contract for a sixth season, they opted to make another one. Thanks, Avi Arad. Saban Entertainment was set to produce, since they still had a contract with Marvel. The first idea was to cheaply animate the first 26 issues of Amazing Spider-Man. You know, like the old Marvel shows in the 50s. However, due to Sony and Marvel making a movie deal, Saban wasn't allowed to use the comics. Okay. So the next idea was to strand Spidey in another dimension, where Uncle Ben was alive, and that world's Peter was still wearing a black suit. Until Marvel shot the idea down thanks to the critical reception of the Clone Saga, and vowed to never have two Spider-Man again. Saban also learned that they weren't allowed to use traditional Spider-Man stories, characters, or his suit either. So how the f*** are you supposed to make a Spider-Man show? The last idea was to adapt Peter David's Spider-Man 2099 comic, which would have worked since it was a new take on the Spidey formula and the futuristic setting was popular in the late 90s. Unfortunately, Marvel passed because Batman Beyond was airing, even though that show was based on both of these characters. With all that trouble in pre-production, it's no wonder we got this. I remember watching this as a kid, but didn't understand what was going on. It was Spider-Man and thus I liked it. But seeing it now as an adult feels like watching one of those foreign ripoffs. You know, other than that one time. It's been 25 years since this show premiered. So, without nostalgic glasses on, can I find any redeeming quality to the show? Let's find out. I able to play this intro but not the animated series? John Jameson, the son of J. Jonah Jameson, is going on a one-man space mission to explore a newly discovered planet known as Counter-Earth, located on the far side of the sun. Now, I'm not an astronomer, but I have Google. There's no way this planet could have been hidden from us. It would have had to have been in our orbital system and would need to orbit at the same exact speed as our planet does. Even if it did, it would have messed with the other planet's orbital system and deflect the path of comets. We figured out the solar system back in the 1400s, so how come we didn't figure this out? How the hell did we create this warp drive engine? And why is this a one-man mission? Shouldn't it be a team since it's a newly advanced planet? This is the first minute of the show and I'm already questioning everything. While on the job, Peter's spider sense goes off. With danger nearby, it's up to... What could possibly be- Oh, f**k you. I will say, this design looks amazing. I think this is the first cartoon to incorporate the underarm webbing, and those yellow eyes are spectacular. The suit just screams vintage. We see that Venom and Carnage are working together. Wait, what? Everyone knows that Venom and Carnage are enemies, yet here they are as friends. Oh, and they can morph into goo now. That's not how the symbiote works. Unfortunately, Spidey fails to stop them, and John loses contact with Earth. Jonah blames them, and thus everyone in New York hates Spider-Man. The next three minutes is just classic Spidey stuff. They nail the hardship this character goes through. Honestly, if the show stayed like this, it would have been perfect. <laughs> Murderer, you're not going any place. For all we know, this fire is your doing. You're blaming me? After all the times I've risked my life for this stinking city, this is the thanks I get? Ah! Look out! While contemplating on giving up the mask, John sends a message back to Earth. This inspires Peter to go rescue him. 
but as the all-new, all-improved Spider-Man. This year's fully loaded model features nanotechnology, discreetly borrowed from the lab of Reed Richards. This scientific marvel features billions of microscopic robots working in harmony to make one spiffy set of duds, complete with optional anti-symbiote devices. I've gone back and forth on this suit for years. On the one hand, it's a cool suit. On the other hand, it's just a rip-off 2099 suit. Listen up, world! This is Spider-Man, on my way to Counter-Earth to save John Jameson and clear my good name. Now to cover Peter Parker's tracks. And I'm going with him, Peter Parker. After all, what newspaper man could turn down an opportunity like this? Wait, why would a random photographer go to space with Spider-Man? People are gonna think you kidnapped him. And what are you gonna do when you return? Three people are expected to come out of that ship. Spidey Crash lands onto Counter-Earth and is captured by the Knights of Woundagore, which is a real thing from the comics, don't ask. Who work for the High Evolutionary? Yes, that one. I honestly forgot he was even in this show because he looks nothing like the comics. He favors bestials and makes them the higher class while the lower class are humans. Okay, one, why aren't humans extinct? High Evolutionary hates humanity, so why are they still here? And two, why is Spider-Man fighting the High Evolutionary? Yes, I like seeing him fight random villains, but this is way out of his league. I know he's fought cosmic level villains before, but would you rather have Spidey fight High Evolutionary or the Guardians? Thankfully, the Resistance helps him escape. The main members consisting of Karen, who's not a Karen, Daniel, Get the Mummy, and new member John Jameson, who won't leave this planet until he takes down the High Evolutionary and forces Spidey to stay and help too. How does this guy expect to fight the High Evolutionary? He's an astronaut, and wouldn't it be better for Spidey to go back to Earth and bring S.H.I.E.L.D. or the Fantastic Four? Even Spider-Man wants nothing to do with this. Hey, I came here to rescue John Boy, not to storm some counter-Earth Bastille. It's not my planet. Look, John John, there's nothing I'd like better than to see the Beasties take a nosedive, but this isn't our fight. Then whose is it? These people need us. So do a lot of folks back home. Mary Jane? Oh, man. Does it? I gotta get off this planet before I wind up dating outside my species. But we all know he can never turn his back on helping people. So for now, our hero lives on Counter-Earth, moving in with a single mother named Dr. Nioko Yamada Jones and her son, Shane. They're all right, but compared to every other supporting character, they're forgettable. Now let's talk about the voice actors. Reno Romano is a talented voice actor who voiced the Batman, the narrator for Curious George, Luis, the original English dub of Tuxedo Mask, and is another one of my favorite Spider-Man. I love how energetic he is. His jokes are so corny, which fits the character. Uh-oh, something tells me that was the frying pan. And this is the fire. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you and the rest of old McDonald's farm, but to paraphrase John Paul Jones, I have not yet begun to flee. <laughs> Listen to Tony here. He's great. I became a fan of his because of the PS1 game, and that's his best performance as the wall crawler. Spider sense tingling. Something's going on here. I don't know what you're trying to pull by saving my life, but it won't work. Oh, you're just too clever for me, JJ. There he is, officers! The man behind the Science Expo heist! Shoot him now! Shoot him! JJ, you are out of the wheel! I mean it this time! The other voice actors are Richard Newman, who did an alright job voicing Jonah, but gives a better performance as the High Evolutionary. Mary Jane was voiced by Jennifer Hale, and unfortunately voices Lady Vermin as well. God, how does she go from cat girl to best girl to rat girl? That brief appearance of Nick Fury was Mark Gibbon. John Jameson is voiced by John Payne, who is also in that Street Fighter show. Karen is voiced by Kim Hawthorne. Daniel is voiced by Christopher Gaze. Lord Tiger is voiced by David Sobolov, who played Drax in The Guardian Show. Sir Ram is voiced by Ron Halder. Lady Ursula is voiced by Tasha Sims, who was Psylocke in the X-Men animated series. The Machine Men were voiced by Dale Wilson, who was Principal Kelly in X-Men Evolution. Venom is voiced by Brian Drummond, f***ing Ryuk himself! And Carnage is voiced by Michael Donovan, who was Sabretooth in X-Men Evolution. There's a lot of talent here, but what about the animation? 
A lot of studios worked on this show. Coco Entertainment was a Korean company that inked and painted a lot of our favorite shows, although they later became a mining company that was involved with multiple scandals. Another South Korean studio named Dong Young Animation and, according to Wikipedia, Atomic Cartoons, who wasn't given any credit. They've storyboarded a lot of other shows and are animating that kid-friendly Spider-Man show. All this outsourcing resulted in a beautifully animated show. I mean, look at it. Look at the shading. We worried about you, man. The art style is amazing and arguably better than most Marvel shows at the time. It perfectly captured the aesthetic of reading a comic book. The music is also great. I don't know why, but techno music and Spider-Man just work together. Looking for another roommate? Guess not! Now let's go over each episode. The reason why Venom and Carnage are here is because of the synoptic. What is the synoptic you ask? Well it's not from the comics that's for sure. It's this ancient green symbiote that called them over to help conquer counter earth. Which is really dumb. These two wouldn't care about any of this. Well, maybe Carnage, but it must be for his benefit. The only reason Venom and Carnage are here is to sell toys. Wait, did this show have toys? Okay, so apparently they didn't get any toys except for one lousy figure in 2005. That's pretty shocking because shows like these have toys come out first. Man, they really didn't have faith in this. We're also introduced to the Counter-Earth version of Green Goblin. He's a vulture flying hero and voiced by Reno Romano. Well, that's funny. Whenever these two are on screen, they just riff off each other, which I guess is just Reno riffing with himself. There's danger here. The only danger we're in down here is breathing ourselves to death. Catch you later. Goblin, look out! Behind you! Ah, booger at 12 o'clock! Don't you need bogey? I don't think so. Time for pre-boarding. Buckle your seatbelt. Um, would you say these uh, tentacles are green? A kind of model chartreuse, but yes, definitely green. Heidi, my pal. Bon voyage. Don't forget to ride. I'll help you pack. Peter gets another job as a photographer for the Daily Bite, working for Mr. Yeah, you're not gonna remember him. What's the point of being a photographer if Jameson's not involved? Does anyone find it weird that this show has a commercial break when there's two minutes left in the episode? Not to mention, make some bucks so I can pay the rent. No! Git steals a bio bomb that's armed with a failsafe, which could destroy the city. This leads to the rebellion and Knights of Wundagore teaming up to stop the bomb. This episode is kind of dumb because no one properly communicates to him, and Git just comes off as an idiot. I'm the only neutral party here. I'll take the canister and see that it's destroyed once and for all. And how exactly do you intend to safely dispose of the virus? Not this time, guys. An old machine man named X-51 comes back online and has become sentient, which is kind of ironic because Dale Wilson was in the Robocop series. It's an alright episode. The only noteworthy thing is that they used a lightsaber sound effect. <laughs> Sir Ram hires an assassin named the Hunter, <sighs> stupid contracts, to kill Spider-Man. You know, for some reason, Hunter sounds familiar. Paul Dobson. I wonder where- Holy shit, he's Master Wu. By the way, he can also fly now. I swear, if I see one more person that can fly, I'm using the Star Wars joke. So Spidey meets Vulture. Eh, that counts. Oh, they fly now! They fly now? They fly now! Who wants to stop Sir Ram from transforming humans into bestials? Now that I think about it, it feels like this show was trying to match X-Men's message with equality. You know, with humans hating bestials and stuff. But no one took this show seriously enough to remember or care about this. Then what do you care about? What do you stand for, Spider Punk? I hate the AM. I hate the PM. I should also point out that every Wikipedia page about this show is wrong. Wikipedia says Vulture killed his family's housekeeper and her son. But he's alive and you can actually see his mother helping him out. 
This fan wiki says Venom and Carnage escaped from Dormammu's dimension, but this show wasn't connected with the animated series. And the trivia page is a joke. No one cared about this series. So why am I making a video about this? With great power comes Don't great- Don't you dare finish that sentence! It's revealed that John was experimented on when he first landed on Counter-Earth, infecting him with the genetic ability to turn into Man-Wolf. John had this wolf condition in the comics, and was kind of an on-again, off-again kind of thing, and we all know this was adapted in Ultimate Spider-Man. So I guess this isn't the weirdest thing here. We also run into an electric eel version of Electro. I fell into a vat of electric eels. You know, as funny as this is, it does bring up a good question. Why didn't they do this for all the villains? Think about it. Most of Spidey's villains are animal themed, and we have bestials, so why didn't they make them animals since they already dressed up as one? Green Goblin could have been an actual goblin. Hunter could have been a lion or replaced him with Puma. And Vulture could have been an actual Vulture. Ultimate Spider-Man did that. What's even crazier is that the Amazing Spider-Man video game used this concept. All the villains in the game were cross species. Rhino, Scorpion, and then they ran out of ideas so they pulled Vermin and Iguana. But the point is, instead of Knights of Wundagore, we could have had an animal themed Sinister Six with an actual Dr. Octopus. Which Ultimate Spider-Man did and it broke me, but it would have been cool here. I can't be the only one who thought of this concept. Someone in production must have suggested this. They probably couldn't because of legal stuff and just played it safe. Great, now I'm sad. Spidey gets the chance to return home. However, Green Goblin figures out that Spider-Man is Peter Parker. Wait a minute, that's not bad. He's a good guy here, so what was the point of that? They get captured by Rejects, a bunch of loser bestials who want freedom from the High Evolutionary, and once again, Spidey decides to stay and help at the cost of his ride home. And he is separated from the symbiote and is dying without it. Spidey agrees to retrieve it and dons the black suit again. Only for 30 seconds, but it was worth it. And while it's still dumb seeing Venom and Carnage team up, it was pretty cool seeing them combine together. Only for 5 seconds, but it was worth it. This might be my favorite episode of the series, which isn't saying much. Bromley gets captured for the second time, all thanks to John Boy here. This leads to him discovering that his brother is alive and oh, who cares about that? He dies anyways. At least Spidey fights a high evolutionary and- Oh god, not him again. Karen gets kidnapped. Jesus, why do any of them go outside? So Spidey and the Rebellion have to go save her. It's also revealed that the high evolutionary is Karen's grandfather. Wait, so the guy who hates humans had children? Oh god, it's Palpatine over again. At least out of all the Rebellion character episodes, this one was the most interesting. While at the same time, frustrating to watch through. You will rue this day, Spider-Man, as will all humankind. At this point, High Evolutionary just says screw it and tries to destroy all humans. Spidey and the Rebellion try to fight back, but are... <sighs> captured. Man, these guys are worse than Ashley. Luckily, Sonics and Green Goblin save the day. Unfortunately, the Synoptics are unleashed onto the world, and thus the show ends on a massive cliffhanger. There was supposed to be a second part, or at least another season, but multiple things stopped that from happening. Fox Kids was nearing its end, the ratings were not as good as the 90s show, the broadcasting was sporadic, and Pokemon came out. This show had no chance of surviving. Fortunately, this show wouldn't be forgotten. The main comic Spidey wore this costume once, Unlimited got a comic series, the PS1 Spider-Man game included this suit with its invisibility, and they named a mobile running game Spider-Man Unlimited, but never included him in the game. There are some pretty good PC mods for Marvel Spider-Man. Oh, and they killed him in the Spider-Verse comic. Thanks, Dan Slott. Actually, that was another version because he was in Spider-Geddon. Oh, and of course, appeared in Across the Spider-Verse. Despite all that, Spider-Man Unlimited is still my least favorite Spidey show. I didn't find Counter-Earth interesting and didn't connect with any of the supporting cast. 
New York is important to the character, and this place was just a cheap, shallow copy. Now I won't say that there aren't good stories of Spidey being outside of his city, planet, or timeline, but those stories still had something to tie him down. There was no reason why Spider-Man had to be here. You could have replaced him with Iron Man, Hulk, or Captain America, and I guarantee you, nothing would have changed. Nonetheless, I can't blame anyone for this. Saban tried to make this show work. However, with all the legal hurdles they had to go through, it's a miracle this show even aired. The show was dealt a bad hand, one that was doomed to fold at the start. If there's one thing I could say for this, is that we'll never see a Spider-Man show like this ever again.